start this video, it would be <clears throat> beneficial to do a word review of two particular terms that most of us, anyway, are uh, overly familiar with <clears throat> too much in some ways. And in other ways, of course, we're not familiar with them at all. And the first of those is the word colored. And this is Wikipedia that uh, particularly helpful, <laughs> or rather terrible resource, is a racial descriptor historically used in the United States during the Jim Crow era. There's a label to refer to an African American. And that's, of course, more stupid stuff with their labels. It, in many places, it may be considered a slur, though it has taken a special meaning in Southern Africa referring to a person of mixed or cape color heritage. The word colored, Middle English. Yeah, I don't know why they put that there. That's stupid. It was first used in the 14th century, but with a meaning other than race or ethnicity. The earliest use of the term to denote a member of dark skinned groups of peoples occurred in the second part of the 18th century in reference to South America. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, color was first used in context in 1758 to translate the Spanish term Lucares de Color. Colored women literally whip of color in Antonio de Lo. Loa's voyage to South America. Notice, of course, where it states women of color. And most recently today, they have essentially brought that quote-unquote designation back. As we look at the term person of color from Wikipedia again, of course. Person of color or person of color, abbreviated P-O-C, it's primarily used to describe any person not considered white, quote-unquote. In its current meaning, the term originated in and is primarily associated with the United States. However, since 2010s, it has been adopted elsewhere in the Anglosphere. Wasn't that a nice uh, term there, Anglosphere? Stupid. Often as person of color, including relatively limited usage in the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Ireland, Africa, and Singapore. In the United States, the term is involved in various definitions of non-whiteness, including African Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans, Pacific Islander Americans, multiracial Americans, and some Latino Americans. And we're going to look at why they use these particular designators today, the denoting somebody as coming from somewhere that they are not from, just simply based off of the way they look such as with the African-American term, most of that is just put on to people with certain physical appearance, despite never coming from Africa. Same thing with Asian, Native, Pacific Islander, and Latino. Multiracial. Stupid. The members of these communities may refer to themselves through their cultural identities rather than color-related terminology. Isn't that nice? But they'll always change uh, whatever you put on the forms for, well, anywhere. The term is used in the United States emphasizes common experiences of systemic racism, which some communities have faced. Ugh. The term may also be used with other collective categories of people, such as communities of color, men of color, women of color. Right. <clears throat> Do we see that correlation there? Women of color? As in the apparent uh, women of color that derive the term colored from? Hmm. Interesting, right? So this brings us to the book Report of the Royal Commissioners for uh, what is that? Inquiring into the laws of naturalization and allegiance together with an appendix containing an account of British and foreign laws and of the diplomatic correspondence which has passed on the subject, reports from foreign states and other papers, presented to both, health, both Houses of Parliament by command of Her Majesty. 1869, London, printed by George Edward I. and William Spotswood. Report. The Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, we, Your Majesty's Commissioners, appointed in to inquire into the laws of naturali 
organization and allegiance, have to state that in compliance with the terms of your majesty's commission, we have inquired into the legal conditions of natural born British subjects who may depart from and reside beyond the realm in foreign countries and have considered how and in what manner having regard to the laws and practice of other states, it may be expedient to alter and amend the laws relating to such natural born subjects, their wives, children, descendants, or relatives. We have also inquired into the legal naturalized as subjects of the crown and have considered how far and in what manner it may be expedient, having regard to the laws and practice of this country, of foreign states, or otherwise to alter or amend the laws relating to such persons or persons claiming rights or privileges <coughs> through or under them. And we don't really need to read the rest of that fluff. There are two classes of persons who by our law are deemed to be natural born British subjects. One, those who are such from the fact of their having been born within the dominion of the British crown. Of course, dominion is up for interpretation usually. Those who though born out of the dominion of the British crown, are by various general acts of parliament declared to be natural born British subjects. The allegiance of a natural born British subject is regarded by the common law as indelible. Here, according to the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, 5th edition, indelible, indelible means impossible to remove, erase, or wash away, permanent making a mark not easily erased or washed away, unable to be forgotten, memorial, memorable. And another word that's important for the context of this video is usurpation. Also, according to the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, fifth edition, the first thing that pops up when you Google definitions of things. One, the act of usurping, especially a wrongful seizure of royal sovereignty. What does royal mean? Well, in Spanish, it's real, and in English, we would call that real. So that's kind of interesting. Either way, they're using the word in the definition, first definition, which is something you're not supposed to do. Then, a wrongful seizure or exercise of authority or privilege belonging to another an encroachment. And that's very applicable. Three, the act of usurping, again, using the word in the definition, or of seizing and enjoying an authorized arbitrary assumption and exercise of power, especially and infringing on the rights of others, specifically the illegal seizure of sovereign power commonly used with of, also used with on or upon. And that's a terrible definition right there. So we're just going to go with the second one. However, it would be important also to comprehend this from the idea of seizing responsibility and duty and then twisting that into a vehicle for privilege and quote unquote authority authority of course being the authorship which is akin to stealing intellectual property but it goes on beyond that so that's where privilege is an important so we get an explanation of how this usurpation takes place and continues to take place, essentially. In the Georgia Code, 1926, all the laws to and including the extra session of 1926, complete annotations under the editorial supervision of Thomas Johnson Mitchie, assisted by A. Houston Mitchie and Bern Bjorn, Bjorn Stedman, with editorial staff of the publishers and L.T. Gillen, R. H. Armstrong, and William A. Ingram of the Georgia Bar. For me, Ingram is a partic particularly interesting last name because of the so-called Ingram Spark, which has to do with uh, book publishing. The Mitchie Company Law Publishers, Charlottesville, Virginia, 1926. Copyright 1926 by the Mitchie Company. And we're just going to go ahead and gloss over the fact that we have parent code codes of law here that are copyrighted by a private company. To start with, we have the Revised Code of Georgia Preliminary Provisions. Um, subsection 1. Laws of force in this state. Laws of general operation in the state are uh, editor's note. This section came from an act of legislature, Act 1784, Cobb 721, which declared all laws in force 
on 14th May 1776, not repugnant to the Constitution, etc., to be perpetuated. The common and statute law of England, so much as was not repugnant to the Constitution, was also adopted. And of course, one has to wonder exactly who is determining the repugnancy here. The common and statute law, uh, wait, the uh, section was codified in the Code of 1863 with the word Confederate, where United now appears. So that's your first imposition of a code. Right? Subdivision there was in effect the same as it is now, but gave the laws in force in more detail the Code of 1873 substituted the word United for Confederate, and Subdivision 3 was changed to meet the new conditions by eliminating such laws that were inconsistent with the new federal government. Section appeared in the Code of 1882, as it now reads, and has remained unchanged to date. One, as the supreme law, the Constitution of the United States and laws of the United States in pursuance thereof and all treaties made under the authority of the United States. So what's happening here is you have the Constitution. Then you have a usurpation by this Confederate thing. And then on the other side of the fence, the new federal government usurps both, but does not reinstate the first being the Constitution. Instead, it declares ownership and control over the Constitution, thus putting the Constitution, not actually a supreme law of land now, nowadays, subordinate to the codes that they're propagating across the board. Before 1863, there were no codes. After 1863, there are only codes, and the codes revise and control everything according to the authors of those codes. Mm -hmm. These codes are copyrighted by a private company, the Mitchie Incorporation. Now, in this next part of the code, this next page, page two, we get a look at a couple things. But the first one to notice is the uh, sort of explanation of universality. Here it states must be universal. The custom need not be so universal as to brace every transaction of the sort. It is enough if it be so usual, so customary, so generally practiced by those engaged in the business that exceptions here and there will only serve to establish the habit of trade. This is like the universal church stuff, which we'll see later. And where it is universal, every person is presumed to know the custom, but this is not true of purely local custom. Parole evidence to show universality. Parole evidence is admissible to show the evidence of a custom of the business in which the contract was made. And then, uh, the implications of that are not completely clear, but then we'll go down and look at promissory notes. A promissory note made payable to bearer is negotiable by delivery and by the usage and custom of merchants has not negotiable quality though it be under seal that interesting about a promissory note most of us are only familiar with promissory notes as far as taking out particular types of loans, maybe student loans, vehicle loans, housing loans, personal loans, etc. Generally speaking, those promissory notes are one way, one-sided, and the same across the board. Code, when, and how to take effect. This code shall take effect on the first day of January, 1863. All offenses committed prior to that date shall be tried and punished under existing laws. And all rights or obligations or duties acquired or imposed by existing laws shall remain valid and binding, notwithstanding the repeal or modification of such laws. So here in this code, we understand and we can tell the usurpation of the Confederate side, as well as the usurpation and the insurrection of the Union, so-called Union side, being the imposition of that new federal government that was listed in the, on the prior page. Now here's a really interesting 
uh, well, there's two interesting parts on this next page. One is the retrospective operations. Definition of retrospective, retroactive statute. The statute is retroactive in its legal sense, which which creates a new obligation on transactions or considers already passed or destroys or impairs vested rights. Usually forbidden, retrospective statutes are forbidden by the first principles of justice. What are these first principles of justice, right? And uh, since when do they are they incorporated into the Constitution? You know, these codes, they like to slip things in there, talk about how it's constitutional what they're doing because they consider themselves claimants over the intellectual property of the constitution they've stolen it essentially and then usurped its position so then they can of course make things such as principles of justice into law and then of course all of these codes use case law meaning they're citing various cases as we see today the never-ending opinions of people who have no legitimate authority to do what they're doing. Uh, down at the bottom, where it states same illustrations, registry acts having a retrospective operation, but have never been considered as falling within inhibition against laws impairing the obligation of contract, provided they allow a reasonable time after their passage to record existing or antecedent deeds. It's an interesting word there, an antecedent deed. As inheritance was allowed to a colored child, therefore illegitimate by retrospective law, also as act providing for collection of taxes on all past contracts of a corporation was valid. So that's interesting. You see what they're doing there is before where people of quote-unquote color had rights and privileges and could do all of these things under the Constitution, those were actually removed, which is contrary, as most of the things in this code, to the current narrative. As we know, they all lie, and then they eliminate things that are contrary to their lies. But also, the imposition of taxes on corporations that did business before is something we see a lot when it comes to the reimposition of everything that came before the War for Independence, thus voiding the War for Independence and repealing anything that happened during that period of independence and reinstituting the colonial of overlordship or the so-called British Dominion. And, of course, re-emplacing everything that was fought over through fraud, right? This is all done through fraud. This is not done through a contest of arms, not done through any sort of honorable measure. This is all fraud, and it's... Uh, very tricky to contend with because it's not a conventional attack, as it were. And then down here at the bottom corner, again, not the Constitution, this is the usurpation by foreign adversaries. Ignorance of law. Laws after promulgation are obligatory upon all inhabitants of the state, and ignorance of the law excuses no one. So the next part that we're going to look at, which is much farther in this extensively and extremely uh, paginated document, right? This is page 2168, and these things are hard to read, so they hide a lot of things in a lot of pages. Well, here we come to something called industrial farms. It is both a farm and not a farm. How establish the purpose and their management? Reformatory prison name change. The reformatory prison shall be called by the name of industrial farm instead of reformatory prison. Well, that would make research into it particularly difficult. When county may establish, whenever the grand jury of the county having a population of 30,000 shall recommend the establishment of an industrial farm or misdemeanor convicts under 16 years of age belonging to said county, the ordinary of such county shall call an election to decide whether the farm shall be established. 
that's interesting. And not to mention their grand jury of the code is not the same grand jury of the Constitution, despite using the same verbiage. It's the same uh, vocabulary. Election when and how held. The election shall be held within 60 days after the recommendation of the grand jury. It shall be conducted under the same rules, blah, blah, blah. The votes cast shall have written on them for industrial farm or against industrial farm. Purpose of the farm. The purpose of the farm is the confinement, punishment, human tre treatment, protection, and reformation of misdemeanor convicts under 16 years of age. And as far as possible, it shall be made self-sustaining by the profitable employment of its inmates. It's not profitable to the inmates, mind you. It's profitable to the people that are setting these schemes up. This is an, not only an act of war, it's occupation by foreign enemies. Every means possible shall be used to reform the inmates. The best instances or influences possible shall be thrown around them. And we'll find out what those influences are in a minute. They shall be encouraged to self-respect and every effort shall be made to build up within them qualities of character and good citizenship. That's a verbiage that we find in the cardinal principle. Good citizenship or worthy vocation. Purchase of site and erection of buildings. The ordinary shall purchase site, erect such barracks, stockades, hospitals, and other buildings, and make such other purchases and do such other things as necessary to the proper establishment and maintenance of the farm. Separation of sexes and races. The buildings shall be so constructed and the plan of the farm shall be such as to keep the sexes and white and colored inmates separate. And of course, you have quote unquote people of color going around using this colored word today, considering the context of its use. It's the same thing as we list out on all of our uh, divisions for different types of government forms or so-called government forms and paperwork and hospitals and stuff where you list out your quote-unquote ethnicity and no matter what you put on it they'll change it which is fraud of course rules for farm management the ordinary shall make and enforce such property rules and regulations for the management of said farm as will accomplish its purpose Uh, and down here at the bottom, verdict and sentence of juveniles, misdemeanor convicts under the age of 16 years convicted in any of the courts of the county, shall in the discretion of the judge be sent to the chain gang or to the industrial farm. If sent to the farm, it shall be with direction that they be therein confined and punished, and the jury shall in their verdict find the age of the defendant. Next, we have municipal farms or other places of confinement, establishment, and control. Authority is hereby given to the municipal authorities of any city in Georgia having a population of not less than 54,000 and no more than 75,000 inhabitants by action of its council or other governing body to establish and maintain either alone or in connection with the county authorities of the county in which said city may be located a farm or other place of confinement which may be situated within the corporate limits or anywhere in the limits of the county where such a city is located and to provide that person's convicted in the police or other municipal courts of such city may be sent to such farm or other place of confinement to be confined into labor during their terms of sentence. And the police or other municipal courts of such city as may take advantage of the authority hereby given are authorized to sentence persons convicted in such courts to the said farm or other place of confinement and to labor thereat during the terms of their sentence. Said municipal authorities are further authorized to make such rules and regulations touching such farm or other place of confinement to the extent of the control thereof by said municipal authorities and the care, custody, and treatment of persons sent from the police or other municipal court as may seem right and proper to said municipal authorities. Minor misdemeanor juvenile offenders, the judges of the state courts located in the county where such farm or other place of confinement may be established are authorized to in sentencing of persons convicted in such state courts or minor misdemeanors and in sentencing juvenile offenders to send them to such farm or other place of confinement to serve their sentence and undergo any labor that may be required thereat. And here at the bottom right corner, purchase a farm and control thereof. 
as soon as practicable after the appointment of the commission, they shall advertise in three daily papers of the state, and if they deem it necessary in several not exceeding ten weekly papers once a week, for eight consecutive weeks for the purchase of not less than two and not more than five thousand acres of land in one body or in several bodies located in different parts of the state. The aggregate not to exceed five thousand acres which shall be accessible by railroad at the time as specified by them in the advertisement they shall receive written offers of sale for such a tract or tracts of land which offers shall be accompanied by perfect abstract of title. Together with a topographical map of the land showing the kind and quality of the clay, the stone, the water power, the water supply, and the railroad facilities. The Commission is hereby authorized to reject any and all offers made or to accept the one which, after a careful inspection and examination, can be purchased the most cheaply, all other requirements being equal. But no purchase shall be made until the abstract of title has been examined and approved by the Attorney General before the purchase is made of the the Commission is empowered to make such contracts with any railroad in the state for the purpose of procuring proper rail facilities and transporting freight and convicts to such point on said tract or tracts of land as may be deemed necessary, but no contract shall be made incurring a greater cost to the state than reasonable tariff rates in transporting freight and passengers to and from said point. So, they take over the United States, right? If it was even called that at the time. They usurp everything, and then they take the local populace and turn them into, essentially speaking, what we're, we understand to be slave labor, or unpaid work, creating a, a litany of poor ten defenses, to quote from the Declaration of Independence, and then subject them to the creation of products, or freight, that will then be sent uh, to other parts of the world and used to subjugate the locals there. And these are the same people that now go around saying that a person of color is the correct term. Yeah. That's called bootlicking, essentially. Next, we come to Article 2 in this section on page 2135. Whipping bosses. Appointment of whipping bosses. The authority of any county or municipal corporation in employing or having labor performed by convicts in such county or municipal corporations may appoint a whipping boss for such convicts and fix his compensation and prescribe his duties. Proper and necessary discipline may be administered by the superintendent or other officer or person having control and authority of a convict without the employment of a whipping boss. No whipping save when reasonably necessary. No whipping shall be administered to a convict by a whipping boss or other officer or person except in cases where it is reasonably necessary to enforce discipline or compel work or labor by the convict. I mean, this stuff could not be more obvious, right? <laughs> it really couldn't be. Now, we come to a different part, which is uh, on 2156 where it states superintendent, etc., not personally liable for damage to convict. No superintendent, commissioner, guard, whipping boss, or other person or employer of convicts shall be personably, personally liable for any injury or damage to a convict resulting from the employment, care, keeping, control, work, and discipline of convicts who under the direction of said governing authorities, respectively in accordance with reasonable and humane rules and regulations thus adopted. Of course, all of these people are still in charge today, and they're still running these code schemes today, in Georgia specifically. I do think it's interesting, though, that here they overtly and directly void the people working on these farms and running them and doing all of this creepy stuff of any liability. Of course, they can declare liability all they want. Outside of their system, all of these people can be held liable through death, right? And probably were. I'm sure a lot of them were killed. But not enough, I suppose, because this stuff continues to go on today under different names. Now we come to the Georgia State Reformatory. They love their cheeky names that they invent. Established and how managed, there is hereby created and established a state institution to be known as the Georgia State Training School for Boys. Hmm. Well, that's not a state reformatory. 
Uh, the note applies to whole article, the Act of 1919, provided that this and the following sections should be amended by striking the word reformatory, wherever the sa same appears, and substitute therefore training school for boys. Wherever the words prison commission and commission appear, that shall be substituted therefore board of managers and board. Now, why would they possibly do that? Hmm. One can wonder. <laughs> Convicts under 16 years old, all male persons of the age of 16 years or under, who have been after the opening of said training school for boys duly convicted in any of the courts of the state, of crime not punishable by death or imprisonment for life, and may in the discretion of the judge having jurisdiction be committed to the Georgia State Training School for Boys. Well, isn't that a nice name? And I'm sure the place is very rosy and, you know, it's all built around good intentions. Now, reading further into this particularly creepy uh, name for a school, which is equally applicable to essentially every school that parents put their children into, uh, indeterminate sentence. The judge committing a person to the Georgia State Training School for Boys shall not fix a limit to the duration of the commitment. Unless the same be for more than five years, but shall merely commit said person to the Georgia State Training School for Boys, but no commitment shall extend beyond the time when the person committed shall have arrived at the age of 21 years. How long a person committed may be held. Any person committed to the Georgia State Training School for Boys for an offensive punishable by imprisonment in the penitentiary may be held in the training school for boys for a term not exceeding five years or if committed for a longer term than five years, may be held for such longer term, and any person committed to the training school for boys for an offense that is punishable as a misdemeanor may be held for a term not exceeding two years. Provided, however, that no person shall be held in said training school for boys after he or she has arrived at the age of 21 years. And, of course, I'm sure there are ignorant, as there are today, people who would send their children to this uh, training school, not realizing what it really is. Which, of course, goes on today in the so-called public schools and other such uh, places. Prison Commission Control. The general supervision, control, and government of said training school shall be vested in a board of managers consisting of the State School Commission of Georgia, the Secretary of the Board of Health of the State of Georgia, no surprise there, both of whom shall be ex officio members of said board of managers and five other persons, citizens of said estate, two of whom may be women to be appointed by the governor. Said board shall be known as the board of managers of the training school for boys. Upon the passage and approval of this act, the governor shall appoint the five appointed appointive members of said board and for two years, two for four years and two for six years and thereafter the successors for term of six years. The governor shall fix a time and place for the first meeting of said board within 60 days from their appointment and shall call said board together for organization and to arrange to take over the control, supervision, and government of the institutions heretofore known as the Georgia State Reformatory. Said board of managers shall receive no compensation for their services except their actual necessary expense in attending upon meetings of said board of performing actual work in connection with said institution, which shall be paid of the general appropriations for said institution. They shall qualify uh, other members, therefore, by taking and subscribing to an oath to faithfully and partially discharge their duties as members of said board, and the president, treasurer, and superintendent of the school shall enter into bond in such sum as shall be described by the governor conditional on the faithful performance of all duties required of them, and blah, blah, blah. Superintendent, teachers, guards, and employees. Yeah. Seems like uh, not only are they trying to fully reestablish this, um, but they, uh, the name change and all of the uh, tactics are to hide what they're doing, basically, and extensive pagination of a very large and thick document. Now we come to who may be committed and how fees for training persons to school. To school, right? Not a prison, it's a school. Because schools are prisons, prisons are schools. Hmm. Think about that one. 
The judges of the city and superior courts may, in their discretion, commit to the Georgia Training School for Girls any girl under 18 years of age who has committed any offense against the laws of the state, not punishable by death or life imprisonment. So say, spitting on the sidewalk, uh, painting a wall without permission, driving without a license, etc., or who habitually associates with vicious or immoral people. So they don't even have to be uh, convicted or committed for any offense. They just could be associated with vicious or immoral people. And, of course, that's up to the discretion of the person doing this uh, nasty crime, this usurpation of the Constitution and violation of it, or who is incorrigible to such an extent that she cannot be controlled by parent or guardian say orphan, right? They are to be held until such girl reaches age of, age of 21 unless sooner discharged, bound out, or paroled under the rules and regulations of said board of managers. Provided, however, that no girl who is insane or an idiot or afflicted with the incurable disease shall be sentenced or committed to said institution. The judges of the city and superior courts may hear and determine such cases residing in court or in chambers, provided that any girl brought before court shall have a right to demand trial by jury and may appeal from the judgment of said court as provided by law. The fees that are now allowed by law for county persons in the penitentiary shall be allowed to the sheriffs of the various counties of the state for services in taking several girls and may be committed to several courts of the Georgia Training School for Girls. Now, if most people today bothered to read and do their research, then they would come to the conclusion that the individuals perpetuating this stuff today, there is nothing that can be done to them that will be um, a, a correct justice for the crimes that they're doing and they're continuing to do today. Of course, the least bit of things will be their elimination from the human populace. But I think it would be fitting for all the little people running these schools, as they call them, and these other institutions of higher treason, well, perhaps they should be whipped to death, right? Maybe they, maybe they should have some whipping bosses. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Now we come to the area of the essential bonding, as it were. Uh, everyone, at least in this context in the state of Georgia, debts other than a bonded debt. When any county, municipality, or division shall desire to incur any debt within the purview and meaning of paragraph 1, section 7, article 7 of the Constitution of 1877, other than a bonded debt, the election required shall be called and held as follows to writ. The officers charged with levying taxes, contracting debts, etc. for the county, municipality, or division shall give notice for the space of 30 days next preceding the day of election in the newspaper in which Sheriff's advertisement for the county are published, notifying the qualified voters that on the day named an election will be held to determine the question whether the debt desired or proposed to be incurred shall be incurred by the county municipality or division. And that's all just a lie, because they're going to do it anyway. And there's some other interesting sections here like uh, investment for trust funds and all of these other different things that they do, like uh, publishing investments by pulling out a, uh, a loan based off of quote-unquote future revenue and all sorts of things like that. But let's go ahead and move on. Here under Article 4 of this section on page 115, bonded debts of municipal corporations with 180,000 or more population. Authority to incur bonded debt, but required. Municipal corporations of the state having a population of 150,000 or more, according to the census of the United States government taking the year 1910, are hereby empowered and authorized to incur a bonded debt or debts for the public purposes of such municipality. Said debt or debts to be incurred for the same purposes and to be secured in the same manner and to be paid principal and interest under the same terms and provisions as now exist for the issuance of bonds for such purposes. Provided said issuance is voted affirmatively at a general election held at the same time that the election of the mayor and general council of such municipality is held by two-thirds of the qualified voters thereof who may vote at said election, 
So two thirds to constitute at least a majority of the qualified voters of said municipality. And of course, we know that that vote isn't going to make any difference whatsoever. Uh, registration of voters not required. The purpose of this act is to enable municipalities having such population to issue bonds within the limits of the present constitution pertaining thereto and according to the present regulations protecting such issuance. But without the present constitutional provisions requiring a majority of the registered vote, which majority shall constitute two thirds of the vote and to substitute in lieu thereof the foregoing provisions under which the two thirds of the qualified voters, whether registered or not, may control the issuance of the bonds. Provided such two thirds constitute a majority of the qualified voters, such result to be ascertained in the same manner as it was ascertained before registration was provided for either by statute or constitution. So this is a tactic that they do a lot. You always see them do it where they list it out in one section and then they completely remove the uh, implications of it in a different section. Essentially, they it's like if they make something a crime in one section and then people that commit that crime in a different section are vindicated or they have immunity from punishment for that crime that they wrote out in one section. Right? They do that tactic all the time. You cannot use these codes ever to hold them accountable, and you will never find justice in any of their phony courts either. And also there's an investment in, of sinking funds. They have investments upon investments, which essentially speaking are fraud because it's the same thing as borrowing upon something that's already been borrowed on. Like if you mortgage your house many times. So here we're going to go ahead and look at some more of this stuff. We have investment in bonds of county, state, or United States. The officer or officers of every municipal corporation in the state charged with the custody of such bonds be, and they are hereby required under the direction of the mayor and council of such municipal corporation, or a duly constituted and authorized committee of the same, to invest within six months from the collection the same all sums collected by such municipal corporations under the requirements of paragraph 2, article 7, section 7 of the Constitution of 1877, for the purpose of payment of the principles of bonded indebtedness to such municipal corporations, and which are not actually payable on such principles within 12 months from the date of collection thereof, in valid outstanding bonds of such municipality. And of course, the principles are going to be your foreign entities, which uh, invoke this type of usurpation, insurrection operation on uh, acts of war, you know, all that treason. And uh, naturally, a lot of those, uh, the investment is going to come from those farms. Invalid outstanding bonds of such municipality or some other municipality in the state of equal or larger size, which have been duly validated in accordance with the law or county bonds of the state, which have been duly validated or valid, outstanding bonds of the state of Georgia or of the United States, and to keep such funds so invested in such bonds, with the privilege of changing the investment from one character of the bonds named to another from time to time, the mayor and county count council may direct until such time before the maturity of outstanding obligations as may be necessary dispose of the same in order to meet such obligations at maturity. Investment of funds on hand. Every municipal corporation of the state having on hand at the date of the approval of this act funds raised under the provision of paragraph 2, article 7, section 7 of the Constitution of 1877 for the payment of the principles of any outstanding bond and indebtedness and which are not payable on such principles within 12 months from said date shall within six months after the passage of this act invest such funds in valid outstanding bonds of such municipality or of some other municipality within the state equal or greater size which have been duly validated in accordance with law or of a county or counties of the state so validated or of the state of Georgia or of the United States and keep the same so invested with the privilege of changing the investment from time to time as in section one provided until such time as it may be necessary to dispose of the same in order to meet the principles of such outstanding bond and indebtedness as the same may become due. And here next below we have changed investments but the important thing to note about this is that the motive behind these investment vehicles that they're establishing here is to make their float their phony uh, monetary system. Now we come to the section on taxes and we should notice that there's a couple things here but the main one being 
in what funds taxes are to be paid. Where it states taxes must be paid in gold or silver or in the bills of such banks as pay species promptly unless especially excluded by law or otherwise directed by the governor. Then we also have a section here where it states that constitutionality, this is on a different section, the form of taxation authorized by this section in no way contravenes the interstate commerce clause of the Constitution of the United States. However, it would violate perhaps other sections of the Constitution and likely does the section that they specifically said it doesn't because that's sort of the game that's being played. And the reference, of course, about gold and silver has to do with uh, the clause in the Constitution about <clears throat> all debts have to be paid in either gold or silver. And uh, this uh, issue around gold or silver will be addressed later in the video. And now we come to the section about weapons. Of course, many are aware of the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that states that for a well-regulated militia, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And of course, the um, <clears throat> this and every other section of uh, codes all seek to circumnavigate and to, of course, infringe on the ability to keep and bear arms. And then, of course, they define militia and do a bunch of other stuff. Um, but right now, we're just going to look at what exactly they're doing with weapons. So, Article 3, carrying concealed weapons, carrying weapons to courts, election grounds, etc., pointing weapon at another, and furnishing weapons to minors. Carrying concealed weapons. Any person having or carrying about his person, unless in an open manner and fully exposed to view, any kind of metal ducks, pistol, dirk, sword, and cane, spear, bowie knife, or any other kind of knives manufactured and sold by the, for the purpose of offense and defense shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. Carrying of deadly weapons at courts, whoever shall carry about his person any dirt, bowie knife, pistol, or revolver, or any kind of deadly weapon to or while at court of justice, or in election ground, or precinct, or any place of public worship, or any other public gathering in the state except militia, muster, grounds, shall be punished as for a misdemeanor. This section shall not apply to a sheriff, deputy sheriff, coroner, constable, marshal, policeman, or other arresting officer for their posse acting in the discharge of their official duties. So there they have that little part in there, except militia muster grounds, so that they can say, essentially along with all of their other clarifications of what their form of the militia is, that the Second Amendment is not, in fact, being uh, infringed. And here at the bottom, constitutionality, they have that in some sections of this code. This section is not null and void because in violation of section 6378 of the Constitution. Uh, nor is it violative of the right of the citizen under Article 8, Section 2 of the Constitution of the United States. But of course all of these are infringements on the Second Amendment. <clears throat> and naturally they don't always specify whether they're re referencing the U uh, U.S. Constitution or the Georgia State Constitution. So here, the Second Amendment, a well-regulated well militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Of course, that section that we just read is clearly an infringement on the uh, right of the people to keep and bear arms because it doesn't specify um, concealed or otherwise. And naturally, the implications being that we do not, in fact, have a free state, nor do we have the security of one. Now, for the context of this document, we'll have to go and look at the canon codes. And we're going to see a very interesting correlation between these canon codes and uh, this 1926 Georgia state code. By virtue of his primacy of governance, the Roman pontiff is a supreme administrator and steward of all ecclesiastical goods. Each diocese is to have a special institute, which is to collect goods or offerings for the purpose of providing according to the norm, CAN 281, for the support of clerics who offer service for the benefit of the diocese unless provision is made for them in other way. 
where social provision for the benefit of clergy has not yet been suitably arranged, the Conference of Bishops is to take care that there is an institute which provides sufficiently for the social security of clerics. Notice that word, of course, there, social security. Security of their state, of course, for, um, in a social manner. Insofar as necessary, each diocese is to establish a common fund through which bishops are able to satisfy obligations towards other persons who serve the church and meet the various needs of the diocese, and through which the richer diocese can also assist the poorer ones. According to different local circumstances, the purpose mentioned in uh, subsection, subsection 2 and 3 can be obtained more suitably through a federation of diocese institutes, through a cooperative endeavor, or even through an appropriate association established for various dioceses or for the entire territory of the Conference of Bishops. So that appropriate association is particularly vague. If possible, these institutes are to be established in such a way that they also have recognition in civil law. That section is pretty important. So the institutes need to be established so that they have recognition in civil law. So say, perhaps, uh, the state of Georgia is such an institute. An aggregate of goods which come from different dioceses is administered according to the norms appropriately agreed upon by the bishops concerned. It is for the ordinary so that word is very important here, ordinary, to exercise careful vigilance over the administration of all goods which belong to public juridic persons subject to him, without prejudice to legitimate titles which attribute more significant rights to him. So here you have a position called the ordinary. The ordinary's job is to administer all goods subject to him which belong to public juridic persons the implications, of course, being that those public juridic persons are subsets or subsidiaries of the quote-unquote ecclesiastical corporation. So on the, in the next part or page of, these, of this particular section, anyway, of the codes, we get some more clarification on what exactly is the ordinary's purpose for the administration of the goods and, of course, the entities subject to the ordinary. With due regard for rights, legitimate customs, and circumstances, ordinaries are to take care of the ordering of the entire matter of the administration of the ecclesiastical goods by issuing special instructions with limits of universal and particular law. So, of course, that means that they control, essentially speaking, what is law or what law is. Uh, in addition to the functions mentioned, blah, 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 the diocesan bishop can entrust to the finance officer the functions mentioned in blah, blah, blah. The administration of ecclesiastical goods pertains to the one who immediately governs the person to which the goods belong unless particular law statutes or legitimate custom determine otherwise and without prejudice to the right of the ordinary to intervene in case of neglect by an administrator. So the ordinary here intervenes in case of neglect by administrators that would uh, inherently be subject to the ordinary. And in the administration of goods of public juridic person, which does not have its own administration administrators by law, the charter of the foundation or its own statutes, the ordinary to whom it is subject is to appoint suitable persons for three years. The same persons can be re reappointed by the ordinary and blah, blah, blah. The statutes are to define the acts which exceed the limit and manner of ordinary administration. If the statutes are silent in this regard, however, the diocesan bishop is competent to determine such acts for the person subject to him after having heard the finance counsel. Pay very close attention to not only the name ordinary, but what those purposes are. One is to intervene, of course, when subsequent uh, subordinate administrators uh, are negligent or um, there's an issue with them, say a vacancy, and also that the ordinary's ultimate purpose is to administrate goods and public juridic persons subservient to the papal structure, basically the canon codes, the, uh, for lack of a better term, Catholic Church. 
So we come back to the 1926 Georgia Code ordinaries. Ordinaries for filing and recording in the minutes the bond required of a seducer when he obtains a marriage license shall have a fee of $1 to be paid by the seducer. So there's a section in Article 12 of witnesses from other counties, etc. on page 1138. Uh, actually, that's not the page, that's the subsection. Page is 2151. And the section is 1138 to 1144. So, of course, this document is very large and there's many things hidden in it. But one of the main things to notice here is the correlation between ordinaries in the 1926 Georgia Code and the Canon Code of, of course, uh, so-called Rome or the Vatican, whatever you wish to call it. So here we find the responsibilities listed in the Canon Codes line up with the ordinary, which are listed in the 1926 Georgia Code. Here's the inspection of books, right? One of the ordinary's responsibilities. Said voters' books and lists taken therefrom, said list of disqualified persons and lists of registered voters shall be at all times open to reasonable inspection of any citizen of the county, but shall not be removed for such inspection from the custody of the ordinary or other officer in charge. At the end of each year, the tax collector shall file all said voters' books in the office of the ordinary of the county, and the county registrars shall also file at the end of each year in the office of the ordinary. Next section, of which there are so many in the code that I could list all of them. Elections to fill vacancies. One of the responsibilities of the ordinary is to intervene when there's negligence or any other issues of administrators subordinate to the ordinary who is acting on behalf of the canon codes. Elections to fill vacancy for members of the General Assembly take place under the authority of a writ of election issued by the governor to the ordinary of the county where the vacancy occurs who must order and publish a day for holding the same by giving at least 20 days notice. Now we have justices of the peace and constables, time and place of election of justices of the peace. Justices of the peace shall be elected on the first Saturday in December 1900 and every fourth year thereafter by the voters of their respective districts, provided they have resided in the districts as much as 30 days immediately preceding the election and are otherwise qualified. The election must be held at the place of holding justices' courts for the district. If none, then at the election precinct, if no election precinct, then at some place in the district named by the ordinary. Now on this page we have two mentions of the ordinary. Uh, who shall be uh, three freeholders of the district who shall be appointed by the ordinary of the county and upon the failure of one or more of the freeholders appointed by the ordinary to act the place or places shall be filled by any of their freeholder or freeholders of the district who shall take the oath required who to preside at constable elections their elections are to be conducted in the same manner as those of justices of the peace with the exception that the returns must be made to the ordinary of the county here we have copy of notice, commission where to issue, and here among the other mentions of ordinary it states, to prosecute his claim and that the delay is not due to any fault on the part of said officer, nor to the selection of any other officer to preside, nor to constituents granted by said officer to either party to be signed by said officer before the clerk of superior court or the ordinary of the county. Other contested elections, contests and other elections, whenever any contest arises over an election of any constable, municipal officers, or other officers not herein for, provided for, the same shall be filed with and heard and determined by the ordinary of the county wherein such contest may arise. Jurisdiction of ordinary, where a contest is filed before the ordinary of the county under provisions of this section relating to contested elections, the ordinary has no other jurisdiction than after examining and counting the ballots as provided in preceding sections of the code relating to contested elections and taking evidence. Same municipal elections, contests over the election of municipal officers are to be conducted under the rules and regulations, blah, 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 except that they shall be heard and determined by the ordinary of the county where such contests arise. 
ballots in other primary elections, and we won't read through the whole thing. All candidates for district and county offices, either by themselves or by the proper authorities of the party nominating them, shall file notice of their candidacy with the ordinary of the county at least 15 days before the regular election. Here under preservation of election supplies, uh, provided whenever in any particular county, city, town, village, or any regular primary election is held in said election and in which each and every candidate has no opponent, the ordinary of the county shall incur no expense for, nor provide, nor furnish any private rooms, booths, or enclosures as provided by Section 138A of this Act. Every candidate has, that has no opponent, the party authorities in case of a primary, nor the ordinary of the county in case of a regular election, shall not be required to provide tickets or ballots in conformity to sections 138.9 and 138.10. Applicability to execution of new bond. Where the sureties were released and the governor ordered the sheriff to give another bond to the ordinary of the county within 10 days, on failure to comply within the time prescribed, he forfeited his right to exercise the duties of the office, although there was a vacancy in the office of the ordinary during the period. Proceedings against person in possession of and refusing to deliver office and contents. Right, One of the responsibilities of the ordinary intervening in uh, uh, events of negligence. If any person neglects or refuses so to do, after demand made, the successor shall make complaint to the ordinary of the county or to the judge's superior court of the circuit in which the person refusing resides. Crossings of public highways. So, uh, avoiding reading the whole thing. Notice shall be given to the clerk of the superior court, to the board of commissioners, the roads and revenues, or if there be no such board to the ordinary of the county where the road is located of the amount of such assessment, who shall have the right to appear before the court and file objections. And here are two sections under Article 4, Poppers, Poppers how buried. Whenever any person shall die in this state whose family and immediate kindred are indigent and unable to provide for the decent internment of such deceased persons, and where the deceased is a pauper and destitute of the means of paying for a decent internment, the ordinary of the county where said death shall occur in case there be any pauper funds belonging to the county, unexpended shall appropriate a sufficient amount thereof to provide a decent internment for such disease, deceased pauper, and such bond to be filed in the office of the ordinary. Said bond must be filed in the office of the ordinary where the paupers are at the time of its execution and upon condition broken may be sued on and recoveries had. Bond of county treasurer and its lien amount of bond, they shall also, within 30 days from their election or appointment, give a bond payable to the ordinary of the county. When surveyor disqualified, when any county surveyor is interested in any survey to be made, the judge of the superior court or the ordinary of the county in which the land is located upon the application of any party of interest shall appoint a competent, disinterested surveyor to make the survey, or the order may, in his discretion, be directed to the surveyor of any adjoining county. If the surveyor appointed is not a county surveyor, he shall, before entering on said survey, subscribe before some judicial officer of the county the oath now required of county surveyors. Disbursements. The amount of such bonds and securities thereon shall be first approved by the ordinary of the county and then filed and recorded by the ordinary as the bonds of other county officers. Duties of County Ordinaries When the amount of the inheritance taxes to be paid by any estate has been determined as provided for in subsection 1041-1, it shall be the duty of said state official to certify the same to the ordinary of the county where said estate is being administered, who shall enter the same upon the minutes of his court and notify the executor or administrator of the amount found to be due. Now we're going to come to the United States Code. And the first thing to notice here is under Aliens and Nationality, we have a long list of transferred or omitted sections. And the transfers are transferred all over the place. And basically they took this Aliens and Nationality Title 18 of the U.S. Code and split it up into and sent it to many different sections of the U.S. Code. So in order to read any of these, you have to hunt down each and every section. Some are sent to the public health and welfare. 
Some were sent to Crimes and Criminal Procedure, and some were sent to, uh, well, this one's District Attorneys, Marshals, and Clerks of Court. Uh, most were sent to Public Welfare, though. However, some were completely omitted, such as Chapter 4, Freedmen. That's an interesting one to have omitted, especially considering the implications of that uh, term, freedmen. Now, another part of the U.S. Code is very important to notice, as will be the next ones, in relation to the continuance of this phoning corporate government uh, without it being centralized, essentially. Change of place of meeting. Whenever Congress is about to convene, and from the prevalence of contagious sickness, sound familiar, or the existence of other circumstances, ha ha ha, say like uh, certain things that were happening in D.C. in 2020, it would, in the opinion of the president, be hazardous to the lives of health of the members to meet at the seat of government. The president is authorized by proclamation to convene Congress at such other place as he may judge proper. Now, we have time of election. Tuesday after the first Monday in November in every numbered year is established as a day for the election in each of the states and territories of the United States, representatives and delegates to the Congress commencing on the third day of January next thereafter. Now, this is from 1875, apparently. So one has to wonder uh, if there was even an election day prior to the imp implementation of this particular section of the code. And also, it should be noticed that everything is stipulated down to the T uh, in these codes, and it's a complete and absolute usurpation of not only the Constitution, but the sovereign rights of any semblance of domestic governance whatsoever. It lifts that all out and puts it into a document, and that document alone is followed as to stipulations of, well, pretty much everything. Now, apart from all of the other interesting uh, components and evidence within these codes, one that I find very applicable to the uh, ability to hold, um, hold events, shall we say, for the phony Congress outside of D.C. because of quote-unquote contagious disease or any other type of... Uh, uh, situation that makes it hazardous for them to stay there. We have mobile office. Subject to the provisions of paragraph 2, 3, 4, and 5, a senator may lease one mobile office for use only in the state he represents, and the con contingent fund of the Senate is available for the rental payments, including by way of reimbursement made under such lease together with the actual non-personal cost of operating such mobile office. The term of any such lease shall not exceed three years. A copy of each such lease shall be furnished to the sergeant at arms of the Senate. That is a particularly important individual. Notice the sergeant of arms of the Senate, the, I guess you could say, true power holder of the Senate, because the senators and anyone in Congress, essentially, are employees. They are essentially just faces that are kept on a leash. The true wielders of power, generally speaking, going to be uh, specific individuals that are not elected and the elections of people to these positions is the equivalent of people voting on who's going to flip their hamburgers at mcdonald's these people have absolutely no power whatsoever to do anything nominations by parties the special election is to be held under the subsection the determination of the candidates who will run in such election shall be made a by nomination made not later than 10 days after the speaker announces that the vacancy exists by the political parties of the state that are authorized by state law or to nominate candidates for the election or by any other method the state considers appropriate including only holding primary elections that will ensure that the state will hold the special election within the deadline required under paragraph 2 and I guarantee that that's going to involve your quote-unquote ordinaries. Next, we have printing and binding as public document of precedence of House of Representatives number sets authorized. There shall be printed and bound as public document 2,000 sets of the precedence of the House of Representatives compiled and prepared by Louis Deschler. Here and after in sections 28B to 28E of this title referred to as the precedence. That's interesting. 
you don't find that very often that you have in codes and other things specific names mentioned. So according to Wikipedia, Louis Deschler was the first and longest serving parliamentarian of the United States House of Representatives. Hmm. I hadn't heard of that position before, before I started reading the U.S. codes. He started his term on January 1st, 1928. Hmm. And what exactly was the date of that Georgia code? During the 70th and United States Congress following the retirement of Lair Fess, prior to the 70th Congress, the parliamentarian position was referred to as the clerk at the speaker's table. Deschler served as the parliamentarian from 1928 until his retirement on June 30th, 1974. During the 93rd United States Congress, he was an important advisor to many congressmen during his employment, including advising House Speaker Carl Albert on the tax fraud investigation of Vice President Pre uh, Spiro Agnew and the impeachment of President Nixon, his tenure span 24. Oh, and then also it would be nice to mention that usually when they say advisors, well, maybe not always, sometimes advisor means advisor, but often it doesn't. It means something else. His tenure spanned 24 Congresses and over 50, 46 years. Dessler was the first officer to become personally influential in his own right. South Carolina Representative L. Mendel Rivers, a powerful figure in his own right, has served nearly 30 years, including as the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee during the Vietnam War, referred to Dessler as the image of Congress. Isn't that interesting? Now... The references for this particularly short Wikipedia article on that individual specifically named in the code, you would think there would be more information on such a person, right? Uh, they come from 1973, 1985, and 1976. Those are uh, three of the four. The first one, however, does not have a date listed to it. So these are all... Relatively new, unfortunately, nothing from apparently when he was alive, 1928, or at least uh, that date as being an important element. So all of these are much later in the 70s and 80s. Coming back to the code, we have funds for Secretary of Senate to assist in proper discharge within the United States responsibilities to foreign parliamentary groups or other foreign officials. This is going to be written in a very interesting way. In general, on and after July 11th, 1987, the Secretary of the Senate is authorized to use any available funds, but not in excess of 50000 for for any fiscal year, out of the appropriation account within the contingent fund of the Senate for the Secretary of the Senate to assist him in the proper discharge within the United States of his appropriate responsibilities to members of foreign parliamentary groups or other foreign officials. Now, does that sound like that's a person who is operating on behalf of domestic interests? It sounds more like he's subservient to those uh, foreign parliamentary groups or other foreign officials. The provisions of subsection A of the section shall be effective in the case of expenditures for fiscal year ending after September 30th, 1986. Upon the written request of the Secretary of the Senate and upon notification to the Committee on Appropriations of the Senate, there shall be transferred any amount of funds available under subsection A of this section specified in the request, but not to exceed 10000 in any fiscal year from the appropriations account. Blah, blah, blah. Now, here's something else that's a little bit interesting, but not necessarily connected to the last thing we read or the other things. Mass mailing sent by House members. Notice that mailing is at taxpayer expense. Each mass mailing sent by a member of the House of Representatives shall bear in a prominent place on its face or on the envelope or outside cover or wrapper in which the mail matter is sent. The following notice. This mailing was prepared, published, and mailed at taxpayer expense. Or notice to the same effect in words which may be prescribed under subsection blah blah blah. I don't know about you, but that looks like a slap in the face more than anything else. Now we have times for election of senators. At the regular election held in any state next preceding the expiration of the term for which any senator was elected to represent such state in Congress, at which election a representative to Congress is regularly by law to be chosen, a United States senator from said state shall be elected by the people thereof for the term commencing on the third day of January next thereafter. And then here we down, have down at the constitutional provisions to make it look like they're quote-unquote following the Constitution, even though they've declared essentially ownership over the Constitution and continuously usurp it. <clears throat> However, the other thing to notice here is that, technically speaking, the 
appearance of the centralized and overarching federal government is actually supported by the foundation of the states. They're essentially all one and the same, and they're all a a acting based off of those foreign interests. Now, this section of the code relates to something that I was particularly and personally involved with, as it were, period for ballot transit time. Notwithstanding the deadlines referred to in paragraphs 2 and 3, in the case of an individual who is an absent uniformed services voter or an overseas voter, as such terms are defined in the Uniform and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act, a state shall accept and process any otherwise valid ballot or other election material from the voter so long as the ballot or other material is received by the appropriate state election official not later than 45 days after the state transmits the ballot or other material to the voter. All right, so to get this right, the transmission of that ballot to the voter starts the 45-day count. Now, anybody who is absent in the uniformed services, I guarantee cannot get that ballot back within 45 days and from the time that it was transmitted to them. So clearly this section in the code is designed particularly to uh, remove the, um, the election capabilities of uniformed service people that are voting. Of course, like I said before, all this voting makes no difference because the individuals that are being voted into positions are employees and have no actual capabilities of changing anything or making any difference in the phony system. However, when I was in the Marine Corps, I didn't vote and... This clearly is one reason why, but the main reason was that everybody always said that, you know, they would lose the ballots and that it was essentially a waste of time. And it was very difficult to get time away from work to even go and vote. So to waste one's own personal time doing something like that, it just um, wasn't worthwhile. And naturally, it wouldn't have gotten there because there's no way that 45 days is enough for that ballot to be sent from its original death, uh, orig uh, point of origin anyway, get processed through all the many layers of postal sorting, especially with bases, to then get to the person so that they can fill it out and then send it back and forget about it if they're overseas because that's going to take a month at least. Well, 45 days is technically over a month, but uh, it certainly wouldn't get back in 45 days, that's for sure. <laughs> Terms of service of members of Congress as trustees or directors of corporations or institutions appropriated for. This one's particularly interesting. In all cases where members of Congress or senators are appointed to represent Congress on any board of trustees or board of directors of any corporation or institution which the Congress makes any appropriation, the term of said members or senators as such trustee or director shall continue until the expiration of two months after the first meeting of the Congress chosen next after their appointment. So, you have members of this Congress who are being put on to the executive board members of corporations and institutions as directors or board of trustees. Now, doesn't that sound like something familiar with a particular uh, group called Burisma? And I'm sure there's many other implications of this everywhere. As long as you know how to frame it and put it into the proper and correct viewpoint that these people are not, in fact, acting as rogue agents or anything like that, but are all part of the same mechanism parading itself as constitutional government. So here we come to a section called, when, under Title II, uh, the Congress, uh, subsection 60C3, withholding and remittance of state income tax by Secretary of Senate. Agreement by Secretary with appropriate state official covered individuals. Whenever the law of any state pr provides for the collection of an income tax by imposing upon employers generally the duty of withholding sums from the compensation of employees and remitting such sums to the authorities of such state, and such duty to withhold is imposed generally with respect to the compensation of employees who are residents of such state, then the Secretary of the Senate is authorized in accordance with the provisions of this section to enter into an agreement with the appropriate official of that state to provide for the withholding and remittance of sums for individuals, A, whose pay is dispersed by the Secretary, and B, 
who requests the secretary to make such withholdings for remittance to that state. And this code is essentially saying that all members, elected members of Congress, are employees. Right? It's just like voting in you who's going to flip your hamburger at McDonald's. Yeah. Now we come to the flag and seal, seat of government in the states. Uh, and this is from 1947. Isn't that interesting? 1947. The flag of the United States shall be 13 horizontal stripes, alternate red and white, and the union of the flag shall be 48 stars white on a blue field. So that would suggest that there were 48 states in 1947. In addition, it would suggest that we didn't in fact have this thing that we called the U.S. flag prior to 1947. So that's something interesting there. General provisions, the flag prescribed by Executive Order Number 10798 of January 3, 1959, shall be the official flag of the United States until July 4, 1960, and on that date, the flag prescribed by Part 1 of this order shall become the official flag of the United States. But this section shall neither derogate from Section 24 or Section 25 of this order, nor preclude the procurement for executive agencies of flags provided for by or pursuant to this order at any time after the date of this order. Now, before I move on to the next section of this particular part three, general provisions, it should be noted that this is the flag of the United States that they changed for one specific time period between these two years, 1959 and 1960. So that's particularly interesting. Now, the other thing about this is that then since this is the flag of the United, phony United States Corporation acting on behalf of foreign interests, those people who go around waving this flag, stating that they're, they are in support of restoring the Republic and draining the swamp and other things like that, they don't obviously don't understand, likely, the implications of the action of waving a flag of essentially an enemy corporation. Now, below it, Section 32, as used in this order, the term executive agencies means the executive departments and independent establishments in the executive branch of the government, right? Independent establishments, including wholly owned government corporations. So what do you think that means, wholly owned government corporations? I'm pretty sure I know what it means. And, of course, the implications would be that the government corporation, which apparently you can have government corporations that are wholly owned, uh, that would mean that the government corporations are subsidiaries of other government corporations, right? Because if you have a government corporation who owns another government corporation, then, well, that's basically stated in plain English there, as it were, in this code. So here we have the flags and all this other stuff, right? You've got the diagram with the proportions and all that. You have the same additional stars. Now this is from 1947. On the admission of a new state into the Union, one star shall be added to the Union of the flag, and such additional addition shall take effect on the 14th day of July, the next succeeding such admission. And under there is the use of flag for advertising purposes, mutilation of the flag, etc. But then we have pledge of allegiance to the flag manner of delivery. So if you pledge allegiance to the flag, then that would suggest that you don't have any allegiance to the Constitution. Because this is the flag of the United States government, which is in fact not uh, following the Constitution and is acting on behalf of foreign interests, not the domestic. And it does not recognize the U.S. Constitution as the supreme law of the land as the Constitution itself stipulates. Because if the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land, then that would make the codes a usurpation of the U.S. Constitution. So isn't that kind of twisty? 
Now we have the display and use of flag by civilians, codification of rules and customs, definition. The following codification of existing rules and customs pertain to the display and use of the flag of the United States of America is established for the use of such civilians or civilian groups or organizations as may not be required to conform with regulations promulgated by one or more executive departments of the government of the United States. The flag of the United States for the purpose of this chapter shall be defined according to sections 1 and 2 of this title and executive order 10834 issued pursuant there too. And of course, this recognizes civilians or civilian groups or organizations as may not be required to conform with regulations promulgated by one or more executive departments. So which, of course, would be those civilians or civilian groups that aren't required? And which are the ones that are required? There's some food for thought. Now here's some another interesting section that relates to the mobile offices and of course the ability to hold uh, Congress at a different location because of contagious disease or other events that are hazardous to their health. Permanent seat of government, all that part of the territory of the United States included within the present limits of the District of Columbia shall be the permanent seat of the government of the United States. And last... In case of the prevalence of a contagious or epidemic disease at the seat of government, the president may permit and direct the removal of any or all of the public officers to such other place or places as he shall deem most safe and convenient for conducting the public business. And so that would, of course, be the reason why all of the offices were empty on that fateful day of January in 2021. Now, here's something else. In the code, compacts between states for cooperation in prevention of crime, consent of Congress. The consent of Congress is hereby given to any two or more states to enter into agreements or compacts for cooperative effort and mutual assistance in the prevention of crim crime and the enforcement of their respective criminal laws and policies and to establish such agencies joint or otherwise as they may deem desirable for making effect of such agreements and compacts. So that has to do with a particular prohibition in the U.S. Constitution about states entering into military compacts, essentially. And this code is stating that Congress has given consent so that they can pretend to be following the Constitution, essentially. However, this is not constitutional. This is, in fact, inimical to the Constitution, and thus makes every individual perpetuating it inimical to every member of the U.S. Armed Forces, despite the fact that people in the U.S. Armed Forces are uh, required to adhere to the code, because everybody in the U.S. Armed Forces swears an allegiance to the Constitution, not the flag. That's a big and very important distinction. If you swear allegiance to the Constitution, but then you're promulgating codes, including the Uniform Code of Military Justice, then you are, in effect, engaging in treason. Although it may or may not be uh, intentional, right? It might not be willful or knowledgeable. Of course, the Constitution doesn't specify that. It sort of leaves it up to the states and the people. It does not leave it up to foreignly imposed codes, however. And the important implication for this is that the facade of the federal government is currently being executed by states. Your IRS agents, your any FDA, your FEMA, your ATF, FBI, etc., any sort of apparent federal entity is currently being carried out by state actors pretending to operate under federal because they have essentially been delegated to in the code, the U.S. code. So here we have a lot of different things going on. Uh, we'll just go ahead and gloss over the income tax and, of course, the exception of Indians not taxed because clearly they tax everybody, even though their taxes are illegitimate and they're not the enumerated taxes listed out in the Constitution. However, here in this section, to support the claim, of course, the very apparent uh, operation of states keeping or propping up the appearance of the federal existing, we have same jurisdiction of the United States over federal areas unaffected. The provisions of section sections 105 and 110 of this title should not be for the purposes of any other provision of law deemed to deprive the United States of exclusive jurisdiction over any federal area over which it would otherwise have exclusive jurisdiction or to limit the jurisdiction of the United States over any federal area. 
Now, why would they put that in there? Because at some point, if the Fed uh, mechanism is able to be reestablished, then they essentially want to be able to take all their crap back. And so that's the reason why you would find such things as local police of a municipal corporation, as it were, guarding uh, military facilities, because that is going on. Now, here's another interesting section, amendments to Constitution. Whenever official notice is received at the National Archives and Records Administration that any amendment proposed to the Constitution of the United States has been adopted according to the provisions of the Constitution, the archivist of the United States shall forthwith cause the amendment to be published, which is certificate specifying the states by which the same may have been adopted, and that the same has been valid to all intents and purposes as part of the Constitution of the United States. And, of course, that's how they pass phony amendments to the Constitution, which they claim intellectual property ownership over. The Constitution, that is. So, the code is in fact set above the Constitution, and the Constitution is made to be subservient or otherwise intellectual property of the code, and of course those that hold the intellectual property for the code, the International Code Council. Now we come to copies of supplements to Code of Laws of the United States and of District of Columbia Code and Supplements Conclusive Evidence Original. Copies of the Code of Laws relating to District of Columbia and copies of the supplements provided for by Sections 202 and 203 of this title printed at the Government Printing Office and bearing its imprint shall be conclusive evidence of the original of such code and supplements in the custody of the Administrator of General Services. So isn't that interesting? This is from 1947. Most of these, in fact, are from 1947, so that's an interesting year as well, just like 1929 and various other uh, specific uh, times of operations and whatnot. However, what this essentially is stating here is that if it comes from a particular location or place, or if it has a certain letterhead on it or on it, then copies are original. They're equivalent to original. That is fraud, right? That is a clean and cut fraud. Now, here's something else. Person, human being, child, and individuals, including born alive infant. This is very creepy. And determining the meaning of any act of Congress or of any of the ruling regulation or interpretation of the various administrative bureaus and agencies of the United States, the words person, human being, child, and individual shall include every infant member of the species Homo sapiens who is born alive at any stage of development. Now, does that sound like something that was written by a member of the species Homo sapiens? Hmm, not to mention, not everybody would agree with that term, Homo sapiens, as a species. As used in this section, the term born alive with respect to a member of the species Homo sapiens means the complete expulsion or extraction from his or her mother of that member. Right? It's a member. At any stage of development, who after such expulsion or extraction breathes or has a beating heart, pulsation of the umbilical cord, or definite movement of voluntary muscles, regardless of whether the umbilical cord has been cut, and regardless of whether the expulsion or extraction occurs as a result of natural or induced labor, cesarean section, or induced abortion. So I don't know why induced abortion would be listed there. And here it's basically stating that you're not a quote-unquote member of the species Homo sapiens until you're expelled or extracted. I mean, who would who would pick wording like that? It's uh, incredibly creepy. Nothing in this section shall be construed to affirm, deny, expand, or contract any legal status or legal right applicable to any member of the species Homo sapiens at any point prior to being born alive is defined in this section. So essentially, until you're quote unquote born alive, you have no of their what they call rights, legal rights, or legal status. Now we come to the section of the United States International Agreements Transmission to Congress, which is essentially more evidence of the foreign character to our allegedly domestic government, which it is not. It's a foreign foreign owned subsidiary. The Secretary of State shall transmit to the Congress the text of any international agreement, including the text of any oral international agreement, which agreement shall be reduced to writing. Other than a treaty to which the United States is a party as soon as practical after such agreement has entered into force with respect to the United States, but in no event later than 60 days thereafter. However, any such agreement, the immediate public disclosure of which would be in the public, in the opinion of the president, 
prejudicial to the national security of the United States shall not be so transmitted to the Congress, but shall be transmitted to the Committee on Foreign Relations of the Senate and the Committee on International Relations of the House of Representatives under an appropriate injunction of secrecy to be removed only upon the notice from the President. Any department or agency of the United States government which enters into any international agreement on behalf of the United States shall transmit to the Department of State the text of such agreement not later than 20 days after such agreement has been signed. So basically, to uh, decode this section of the code, uh, you can have agreements that are done with president and and um, Congress, but then you have separate agreements entirely made between departments and agencies. And those don't go to Congress or the president. Those go to the uh, Secretary of State. Isn't that interesting? Now, we have United States International Agreements Transmission to Congress, and this uh, is under general provisions. The Secretary of State shall transmit to the Congress the text of any international agreement, including the text of any oral international agreement, which agreement shall be blah, blah, blah. Uh, I just read that. Um, see, notwithstanding other provision of law, an international agreement may not be signed or otherwise concluded on behalf of the United States without prior consultation with the Secretary of State. Such consultation may encompass a class of agreements rather than a particular agreement. So that doesn't sound like anybody else but the Secretary of State actually has any ability to make agreements or to do anything. They are the overseer, as it were, of international agreements. And guess what? Nobody votes Secretaries of State into office. Secretary of State shall annually submit to Congress a report that contains an index of all international agreements listed by country, date, title, and summary of each such agreement, including description of the duration of activities under the agreement and the agreement itself that the United States has signed, proclaimed, or with reference to any other final formality has been executed or that has been extended or otherwise modified during the preceding calendar year and has not been published or is not proposed to be published in the compilation entitled United States Treaties and Other International Agreements. So there, of course, you find out that, in fact, the Secretary of State is the one that does these things on behalf of everyone, essentially, as regards foreign agreements, and nobody else. Now, we have two things here. First, we have Little and Brown's Edition of Laws and Treaties, Slip Laws, Treaties, and Other International Acts Series, Admissible in Evidence. This is very weird. The edition of the laws and treaties of the United States published by Little and Brown, and the publication in slip or pamphlet form of the laws of the United States issued under the authority of the archivist of the United States, and the Treaties and Other International Acts Series issued under the authority of the Secretary of State, shall be competent evidence of the several public and private acts of Congress and of the treaties, international agreements other than treaties, and proclamations by the President of such treaties and international agreements other than treaties, as the case may be, therein contained in all the courts of law and equity and of maritime jurisdiction and in all the tribunals and public offices of the United States and of the several states without any further proof or authentication thereof. So what exactly is this Little and Brown publisher who can publish laws across the board and their name being put on it is enough of authenticity and requires no further um, identification, basically authentication, you know. And then we have sealing of instruments. In all cases where a seal is necessary by law to any commission, process, or other instrument provided by the laws of Congress, it shall be lawful to affix the proper seal by making an impression therewith directly on the paper to which such seal is necessary, which shall be as valid as if made on wax or other adhesive substance. And that, of course, propagates fraud because they remove many of the things to authenticate legitimate documentation. So Little and Brown and Company, according to Wikipedia, is an American publishing company founded in 1837 by Charles Coffin Little and James Brown in Boston. For close to two centuries, it has published fiction and nonfiction by American authors. Early lists featured Emily Dixon's poetry and Bartlett's familiar quotations. Since 2006, Little and Brown and Company is a division of the Hachette Book Group. So what's the Hachette or Hachette Book Group? Hachette Book or Hachette Book Group, HBG, is a publishing company owned by Hachette Livre, the largest publishing company in France. 
The third largest trade and educational publisher in the world, Hatchet Leave, is a wholly owned subsidiary of Lugadier Group. HBG was formed when Hatchet Leave, per Leave purchased the Time Warner Book Group from Time Warner on March 31, 2006. Its headquarters are located at 1290 Avenue of the Americas, Midtown Manhattan, New York City. Hatchet is considered one of the big five publishing companies along with Holtz Brick Macmillan. Penguin Random House, HarperCollins, and Simon Schuster. In one year, HBG publishes approximately 14,000 or 1,400 plus adult books, including 50 to 100 digital only titles, 300 books for young readers, and 450 audiobook titles. Blah, blah, blah. So, a corporation, an entity, which is a subsidiary of a French company, has the capability to publish editions of the U.S. Code which require no further authentic authentication other than the name Little and Brown uh, being the source. And here we'll read that again, of course, that one section about sealing of instruments. In all cases where a seal is necessary by law to any commission, process, or other instrument provided for by the laws of Congress, it shall be lawful to fix the proper seal by making an impression therewith directly on the paper to which such seal is necessary, which shall be as valid as if made on wax or other adhesive substance. Okay, so why is this important? Well, a warrant signed by a king in the past would bear a seal. That seal, usually of a scroll, over, made over a scroll, will not only have a wax stamp using a signet ring, something that demonstrates the authenticity of the bearer, but it will also be sealed so that if the wax seal is broken, it's obvious it has been read. Now, in the 17th century Japan, there were ships that were done under red seal that meant they had official protection of the Japanese and to attack them was an act of war. Also you have a particular level of authentication when it comes to legitimate publishing. Nowadays we have these stamps that are made on paper across the board and it all relates to this section of the code which makes everything very much easy to fabricate but that's exactly what they want because they themselves those that establish set up and enforce these processes or administrations are themselves fraudulent now we have delegation of function of committee on the judiciary to other agencies printing and so forth under the direction of joint committee on printing so you have a lot of these sections in the code scattered throughout it a delegated authority to different areas so that the fiction of the U.S. code government will continue to be propagated by all subsidiary entities. The functions vested by sections 201202, 204-207 of this title in the Committee on the Judiciary of the House of Representatives may from time to time be vested in such other agencies as the Congress may by concurrent resolution provide provided that the printing, binding, and distribution of the volumes and publications enumerated in sections 202 and 203 of this title shall be done under the direction of the Joint Committee on Printing. So, we come to the Wikipedia article defining what the Parliamentarian of the United States House of Representatives, among the other offices that are, first of all, not elected, and second of all, hold the real power and ability to make changes, and the, many of them most people haven't heard of, just like the parliamentarian. And it says the parliamentarian of the United States House of Representatives manages, supervises, and administers the office of the parliamentarian, who is responsible for advising, yeah, I'm sure advising doesn't really mean that, the House's presiding officers, members, and staff on procedural questions under the U.S. Constitution and House rules and precedents, as well as for preparing, compiling, and publishing the precedents of the House. So he's the manager, essentially. The parliamentarian is the manager, um, along with, of course, the secretary of the Senate. Next, we have the sergeant at arms and doorkeeper of the United States Senate, originally known as the doorkeeper of the Senate from April 7, 1789 to 1798. And, of course, that's fraudulent and bogus because I could guarantee that they didn't actually have a quote-unquote doorkeeper of the Senate at the time. They might have had somebody equivalent to that, or at least who had the simple um, work of something. But the doorkeeper is a position that has well been documented throughout 
um, <laughs> well, protocols of Masonic and other secret sects. Anyway, is the protocol officer, executive officer, and highest ranking federal law enforcement officer of the Senate of the United States. The office of the Sergeant Arms of the Senate currently has just short of 1,000 full time staff. Of course, their job is to keep all of the employees in line through threat of force. One of the rules of the Sergeant at Arms is to hold the gavel when not in use. The Sergeant at Arms can also compel the attendance of an absent senator when ordered to do so by the Senate. They're employees, right? They're like hamburger, hamburger flippers. They have no actual ability to do anything but present a face. With the architect of the Capitol and the House Sergeant at Arms, the Sergeant at Arms serves on the Capitol Police Board responsible for security around the building. The Sergeant of Arms can, upon orders of the Senate, arrest and detain any person who violates Senate rules or is in found of contempt of Congress. So now we come to the point of uh, the gold and silver coinage as it relates to the U.S. Constitution and the monetary system today. To start with, we have the Rix dollar. I don't know if I'm saying that right. But the first things to notice here is Rix and dollar. So Rix is being appended or used as a modifier of the word dollar to state that it's a particular kind of dollar. Rix dollar is the English term for silver coinage used throughout the European continent. German Reichs Taller, Dutch Reichs Dalder, Danish Reichs Dalder, Dollar, Swedish Reichs Dollar. So, in three in in Danish and Swedish you have dollar, in Dutch you have dalder, and in German you have taller. Just ignore the additions of Reich, Reichs, Riggs, and Riggs, because they're all called dollars. Same term was used of currency in the Cape Colony in Ceylon. However, the Rix dollar only existed as a coin in Ceylon. Unissued remainder book notes for the Cape of Good Hope dominated the Rix dollars exist, but these are very rare. Rix dollars are used throughout the 17th century American and most Dutch colonies. So, of course, they're attempting to pretend like the divided uh, fake currencies that we have today have been going on for a time out of mind, but in fact, they weren't. There was an a unified monetary currency around uh, silver coinage called a dollar, taller, dalder, or in the case of Danish and Swedish, dollar. So a taller or taler, previously spelled taller, is one of the large silver coins minted in the states and territories of the Holy Roman Empire and the Habsburg monarchy during the early modern period. A taller sized coin was a diameter of about 40 millimeters, one and a half inch, and a weight of about 25 to 30 grams. The word is shortened from Joksmintaler, the original taller coin minted in Joksmintal, Bohemia from 1520. While the first standard coin of the Holy Roman Empire was the Golden Groschen of 1524, its longest-lived coin was the Reichstaler, which contained 119 cologne mark of the fine silver, or 25.984 grams, and which was issued on various versions from 1566 to 1875. From the 17th century, a lesser-valued North German taller currency unit emerged, which by the 19th century became par with the Varens taller. And of course, these are all essentially called the same thing, dollars. And they, the a narrative here is that there were separate different types of currencies when it came to dollars. But they're still all called dollars and they're still all traded around the world with the same name. So isn't that interesting? This brings us to a particular article off Substack from David Jensen, apparently, July 1st, 2024. The London silver market is ground zero. The COMEX is not the center for silver price setting. So we aren't going to read this whole article, but we'll highlight a particular portion. The largest cash market for silver, representing over 90% of global daily cash silver trading, is the city of London's OTC over-the-counter silver market. Here, cash slash spot trade of silver contracts use daily trading that can exceed 300 million ounces of net settled claims, according to LBMA. Clearing data equating to daily turnover of 3 billion ounces of cash market physical silver claims. These cash slash spot contracts claims are immediate ownership claims for silver bars in the London market, and holders believe they can get silver bars for these contracts. The misleading price setting in London arises because the cash slash spot contracts for these silver bars are merely promissory notes and can be created without limit. And the London silver market operating in oversight by the Bank of England, currency creators, monetary regulators, does not disclose total London silver spot market claims in the world's largest silver market. So basically what they're doing, because they can do it, and nobody else can, 
but there's a particular purpose for it. They are essentially lying about the amount of silver in circulation. Now, when you lie about the something being in a large quantity, it would, of course, mean that the price is suppressed. Because when you have more of something, you have no rarity of it, which means that it's cheaper to acquire. Now, why specifically would they do this? Well, because in their mechanism, it allows them to buy up large quantities of the substance with, at a fraction of the price of what they should be paying because they're, um, they're rigging it so that the price appears to be lower because they're pretending that there's more in the market than actually is. And when you have to buy up a ridiculously large quantity of silver at low cost that you are essentially um, fixing, right? It's fixing the price. Uh, it, it's a, sort of the opposite of price gouging. They're actually driving it down on purpose. Well, the most logical conclusion is that that silver is going somewhere. And today, it's more than likely the majority is going to build solar farms because apparently silver is a primary component in that. And those silver farms appear to be, anyway, rhombic antennae. Not, in fact, uh, energy collectors of solar power because the specific need for silver and other metals to be used when it comes to antenna relates to not collection, but rather transmission. And here, this last note, annual mine production of silver is approximately 0.825 billion ounce in London and New York market vaults hold about 1.1 billion ounce of silver of which approximately half is claimed by ETFs. Much of the remainder is owned privately and not available for trading. The balance sheet for London cash slash spot silver bar claims versus globally available silver bar simply does not balance. So, according to Wikipedia, the London Metal Exchange, LME, is a futures and forwards exchange in London, United Kingdom, with the world's largest market and standardized forward contracts, futures contracts, and options on base metals. So, yeah, that's basically hypothecation or borrowing upon things that have already been borrowed on and in fact at this point don't even exist because it's creating the appearance of a, a, a unrealistically large quantity of the substance in the market of which there really isn't and if which is unlikely all the people who held these futures and these uh, hypothecated things all went and claimed their stuff up at the same time they would find out that there's not actually anything there to pay them out because they're holding a worthless piece of crap because they've been lied to. And this is possibly one of the most extensive global uh, fraud schemes that has an impact on everyone's lives across the planet. And the exchange also offers contracts on ferrous metals and precious metals. The company also allows for cash trading and offers hedging, worldwide reference pr pricing, and the option of physical delivery to settle contracts. So now we come to the Sumitomo Copper Affair, refers to a metal trading scandal in 1996 involving Yasuo Hamanaka, the chief copper trader of the Japanese trading house of Sumitomo Corporation. The scandal involves authorized, in tra authorized trading for over a 10-year period by Hama Hamanaka, which led Sumitomo to announce U.S. $1.8 billion in related losses in 1996 when Hamanaka's trading was discovered and more related losses subsequently. The scandal also involved Hamanaka's attempts to corner the entire world's copper market through the LME copper futures contracts on the London Metal Exchange. Now we're going to see a pattern here. The State Reserves Bureau copper scandal refers to a loss of approximately US $150 million as a result of trading LME copper futures contracts at the London Metal Exchange by rogue trader Liu Kibing, who is the chief trader for the Import and Export Department of the State Regulation Center for Supply Reserves, SRCSR for the trading company of the State Reserves Bureau, SRB of China, in 2005. Now, Silver Thursday was an event that occurred in the United States silver commodity markets on Thursday, March 27, 1980, following the attempt by brothers Nelson Bunker Hunt, William Herbert Hunt, and Lamar Hunt, also known as the Hunt Brothers, to corner the silver market. A subsequent steep fall in silver prices led to panic and commodity on the futures exchange. And, of course, I bet you can guess 
what exactly the exchange was that they were associated with. There's a couple, uh, there's a couple themes here. One, of course, is that particular entity, the London Metal Exchange, and also the fact that all of these people took great deal of losses for hypothecation. Now, while the individuals were blamed for it, they all relate to that London Metal Exchange, which has no, never been brought down for essentially fraud and cornering the markets. <laughs>